Hi everyone, this is Chris Morosky, and in this video we are going to cover some of the benign breast diseases. Importantly, all of the content from this video came from the ninth edition of the Robbins and Cotran Pathologic Basis of Disease. Um, the tenth edition is much smaller now and doesn't really do this topic justice, so I went back to the ninth edition and I pulled all the important information out of there to create this video, but it really comes verbatim from the chapter on benign breast disease, pages 1046 to 1051. If you can get your hands on that, that's a good read along um, also with this video. So let's first start with the inflammatory disorders. The first is squamous metaplasia of the lactiferous ducts. In this condition, patients present with a painful erythematous subareolar mass that appears like an abscess. In recurrent cases, a characteristic fistula tract tunnels under the smooth muscle of the nipple and opens onto the skin at the edge of the areola, as you can see in the image to the right. The key feature is keratinizing squamous metaplasia of the nipple ducts. On the right, you can see a normal nipple duct with the double-layered cuboidal epithelium. On the left, where the abscess is, you can see the squamous metaplasia extending deep into the duct. Keratin shed from these cells plugs the ducts and causes dilation and eventual rupture. An intense granulomatous inflammatory response develops once keratin spills into the surrounding periductal tissue. Interestingly, more than 90% of the afflicted people are smokers. This is possibly due to a relative deficiency of vitamin A associated with smoking and causes alterations to the differentiation of the ductal epithelium. Incision and drainage can treat the abscess cavity, but not the keratinized epithelium. End block surgical removal of the involved duct and continuous tract is often needed for recurrent cases. Antibiotics are also used for secondary bacterial infection. Mammary duct ectasia presents also as a palpable periareolar mass that is often associated with a thick, white nipple secretions and occasionally skin retraction. Pain and erythema are uncommon as opposed to the squamous metaplasia of the lactiferous ducts. Mammary duct ectasia tends to occur in women in their fifth or sixth decade of life and usually in multiparous women. This condition is not associated with smoking. The ectatic dilated ducts are filled with inspissated secretions and numerous lipin-laden macrophages. When ruptured, a marked periductal and interstitial chronic inflammatory reaction ensues, consisting of lymphocytes, macrophages, and variable numbers of plasma cells. Granulomas may form around cholesterol deposits and secretion. Subsequent fibrosis produces an irregular mass with skin and nipple retraction. The principal significance of this disorder is that the irregular palpable mass mimics the clinical and radiographic appearance of invasive carcinoma. Fat necrosis presents as a painful palpable mass, skin thickening or retraction, or mammographic densities or calcifications as can be seen in the mammogram to the right. About half of affected women have a history of breast trauma or prior surgery. The presentations of fat necrosis are protean and can closely mimic cancer. With fat necrosis, acute lesions may be hemorrhagic and contain central areas of liquefactive fat necrosis with neutrophils and macrophages. Over the next few days, proliferating fibroblasts and chronic inflammatory cells surround the injured area. Subsequently, giant cells, calcifications, and hemosiderin make their appearance, and eventually the focus is replaced by scar tissue or is encircled and walled off by fibrous tissue. Ill-defined, firm, gray-white nodules containing small, chalky white foci are grossly seen, as you can see on the right. And last but not least, sclerosing lymphocytic lobulitis, which is also known as lymphocytic mastopathy. This condition presents with single or multiple very, very hard palpable masses or mammographic densities. It can be difficult to obtain tissue with a needle biopsy due to the dense collagenized scroma. Atrophic ducts and lobules have thickened basement membranes and are surrounded by a prominent lymphocytic infiltrate. You can see all of this in the image to the left. Look at all that stroma. This condition is most common in women with type 1 insulin-dependent diabetes or autoimmune thyroid disease, and interestingly, is hypothesized to have an autoimmune basis. Its only clinical significance, however, also is that it must be distinguished from breast cancer. Okay, next let's discuss the non-proliferative breast changes, which is also called fibrocystic disease. Fibrocystic change can mean a lot of different things to different people. To the clinician, the term might mean lumpy, bumpy breasts on palpation, 
to the radiologist, a dense breast with cysts or calcifications, and to the pathologist, benign histologic findings. So let's take a look at all of these different things. First, breast cysts. Calcifications are common and may be detected by mammography. In the image A, you can see clustered, rounded calcifications in the specimen radiograph. Small cysts form by the dilation of lobules and in turn may coalesce to form larger cysts. Unopened cysts contain turbid, semilucent fluid of a brown or blue color, also called blue dome cysts. In the image in B, the gross appearance of typical cysts filled with dark, turbid fluid contents can be seen. On this pathology slide, you can see that cysts are lined either by a flattened atrophic epithelium or by metaplastic apocrine cells. The latter apocrine cells have abundant granular eosinophilic cytoplasm and round nuclei and closely resemble the normal apocrine epithelium of sweat glands. Cysts may cause concern when they are solitary and firm to palpation. The diagnosis is confirmed by the disappearance of the mass after fine needle aspiration of its contents. And then onto the fibrosis and adenosis. So first the fibrosis. Cysts frequently rupture, releasing secretory materials into the adjacent stroma. The resulting chronic inflammation and fibrosis contribute to the palpable nodularity of the breast. Adenosis is defined as an increase in the number of asinine per lobule. This is a normal feature of pregnancy and lactation. In non-pregnant women, adenosis can occur as a focal change. And you can see all these increased asinine to the right with the fibrosis around them. Calcifications are occasionally present within the lumens. The asini here are lined by columnar cells, which may appear benign or show nuclear tibia called flat epithelial atibia. All right, and now moving on to the proliferative breast disease without atibia. Lesions characterized by proliferation of epithelial cells without atypia are associated with a small increase in the risk of subsequent carcinoma in either breast. They are commonly detected as mammographic densities, calcifications, or as incidental findings and biopsies performed for other reasons. These lesions are not clonal and are not commonly found to have genetic changes. Thus, they are predictors of risk, but unlikely to be true precursors of carcinoma. The first here is epithelial hyperplasia. Normally, breast ducts and lobules are lined by a double layer of myoepithelial cells and luminal cells. In A, you can see a normal duct or acinus with a single basally located myoepithelial cell layer. In epithelial hyperplasia, increased numbers of both luminal and myoepithelial cell types fill and distend ducts and lobules. Irregular lumens can often be discerned at the periphery of the cellular masses. Epithelial hyperplasia is usually an incidental finding on biopsy. In B, you can see the epithelial hyperplasia. The lumen is filled by a heterogeneous mixed population of luminal and myoepithelial cell types. Irregular, slit-like fenestrations are prominent at the periphery. Sclerosing adenosis. In sclerosing adenosis, there are an increased number of asini that are compressed and distorted in the central portion of the lesion. On occasion, stromal fibrosis may completely compress the lumens to create the appearance of solid cords or double strands of cells lying within dense stroma, a histologic pattern that at times closely mimics invasive carcinoma. Sclerosing adenosis can come to attention as a palpable mass, a radiologic density, or calcifications. The involved terminal duct lobular unit is enlarged, and the asini are compressed and distorted by dense stroma. Calcifications are present within some of the lumens. Unlike carcinomas, however, the asini are arranged in a swirling pattern, and the outer border is well circumscribed. Intraductal papilloma. Papillomas grow within a dilated duct and are composed of multiple branching fibrovascular cores. Epithelial hyperplasia and apocrine metaplasia are frequently present. Large duct papillomas are situated in the lactiferous sinuses of the nipple and are usually solitary. Small duct papillomas are commonly multiple and located deeper within the ductal system. In the photo here, you can see a central fibrovascular core extending from the wall of the duct. The papillae are rise within the lumen and are lined by myoepithelial and luminal cells. More than 80% of large duct papillomas produce a nipple discharge. Some discharges are bloody if the stalk undergoes torsion causing infarction. Serous discharge results from intermittent blockage and release of normal breast secretions or irritation of the duct by the papilloma. Most small duct papillomas come to clinical attention as small palpable masses, 
or as densities or calcifications seen on mammograms. Next is the complex sclerosing lesion. These lesions have components of sclerosing adenosis, papillomas, and epithelial hyperplasia. One member of this group, the radial sclerosing lesion, also called a radial scar, has an irregular shape and can closely mimic invasive carcinoma mammographically, grossly, and histologically. A central nidus of entrapped glands in a hyalinized stroma is surrounded by long radiating projections into the stroma. The term radial scar is actually a misnomer as these lesions are not associated with prior trauma or surgery. In image A here, the radiograph shows an irregular central mass with long radiodense projections, looks like cancer, and grossly, the mass also appears solid and has irregular borders. However, it is not as firm as invasive carcinoma. All right, and we'll end this video with proliferative breast disease with atypia. Atypical hyperplasia is a clonal proliferation having some, but not all, of the histologic features that are required for the diagnosis of carcinoma in situ. It is associated with a moderately increased risk of carcinoma and includes two forms, atypical ductal hyperplasia and atypical lobular hyperplasia. Atypical ductal hyperplasia is present in 5 to 17% of specimens from biopsies performed for calcifications. Atypical lobular hyperplasia is an incidental finding and is found in fewer than 5% of biopsies. Okay, so atypical ductal hyperplasia. ADH is recognized by its histologic resemblance to ductal carcinoma in situ, also known as DCIS. ADH consists of a relatively monomorphic proliferation of regularly spaced cells, sometimes with cribriform spaces. It is distinguished from DCIS in that it only partially fills involved ducts. So here in image A, a duct is filled with a mixed population of cells consisting of oriented columnar cells at the periphery and more rounded cells within the central portion. Although some of the spaces are round and regular, the peripheral spaces are irregular and slit-like. These features are highly atypical but fall short of a diagnosis of ductal carcinoma in situ. Atypical lobular hyperplasia. ALH consists of cells identical to those of lobular carcinoma in situ, but these cells do not fill or descend more than 50% of the asini within a lobule. Atypical lobular cells may lie between the ductal basement membrane and overlying normal luminal cells. So here in image B, a population of monomorphic, small, round, loosely cohesive cells partially fills a lobule. Although the cells are morphologically identical to the cells of the lobular carcinoma in situ, the extent of involvement is not sufficient for this diagnosis. All right, everybody, that's going to do it for this video. Again, the reference here for all of this material comes from the ninth edition of Robinson Cotran, Pathologic Basis of Disease, Chapter 23, The Breast, pages 1046 to 1051. Good luck with your studies, and I'll see you in class. Bye-bye.